It's the World Cup of World Cups, episode 13, Mexico, 1986. Saturday, 31st of May, 1986. Corruption charges against West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl are dropped. Biggles hits UK cinema screens to almost complete apathy. And Donald Trump offers to build an ice rink in New York. Meanwhile, in Mexico City, it's all kicking off. Columbia say it would cost too much to meet FIFA's criteria. Is criteria another word for bribe? <laughs> <laughs> this is why I love the World Cup. Yes. How can one uh, man win a Mexican wave? Surely that's... <laughs> he was just incredibly charismatic. It's just health and safety gone mad, isn't it? Thank God for Britain. <laughs> we don't have to put up with any of that nonsense. <laughs> My wife, come back to me. No, I am with former World Cup <laughs> striker... Dominic Rushta. You can either be sent home in disgrace for drugs or tell everyone that you've got the shits. That's a death wish. It's like doing a Formula One race naked. Like French kissing a shark. Hola, que buen venidos u podcast la luch sac vino o yucalcaba copos o yucalcabe episodio treche. Mexico mil novocientos ochenta y tel sies in cabal James Cook y tel accompanima mantas Paul Savage. Hola, Paul. Bixa Beal. Bixa. Do you have any idea what language that was? It's based on Spanish a bit, isn't it? It's Yucatec Mayan. Ah. The third most popular language in Mexico, as we've already done the first two. I can't wait till 2026 when we're down to the fifth one. Also joining us on the World Cup of World Cups podcast today is a comedian, Sony Award winning writer and Twitter punster who supports Ipswich Town and has written jokes for greeting cards. It's Tony Cowards. Hola. What was Daytime. that, May in Yucatan? Wasn't she Yuc- the, Yuc- the terrible singer that was on the Clive James show? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, she was. <laughs> Tony, thank you for coming to talk about 1986 World Cup with us. What well, uh, What you. are your sort of general memories of that World Cup? Where were you at? Um, let's start with how old I was. I was 13, so prime kind of football age. I was obsessed with football. Bizarrely, it was a bit of a terrible year in some ways because Ipswich had just got relegated from the first division. But then there was a World Cup. Obviously, Bobby Robson was the manager, massive hero of mine, ex-Ipswich manager. And I think I'm right in saying it's the last competitive England match or like tournament England match featuring or matches featuring an Ipswich player because Terry Butcher was still technically an Ipswich player. He hadn't transferred to Rangers just yet. Um, oh. So I was very excited about the World Cup. It's the first one I kind of remember watching. England did pretty well, then got beaten by Argentina, which... Whoa, oh. spoilers. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. I think it did quite well. And then the game where, you know, against Argentina, where nothing much happened, really, but England went out. <laughs> and then the World Cup kind of, being a third petulant 13-year-old, the World Cup stopped for me. It's like, I kind of, I don't think I even watched the final. So we're going to be able to tell you what happened next. Yeah, so I'll find out what actually happened after the quarterfinals. Yeah. We'll be glad to fill you in. Before we get into Mexico 1986, I'll quickly give you the answer to the teaser from the end of the last episode when we were talking about Claudio Gentile, who was the first African-born World Cup winner, having been born in Tripoli. We said there have been four African-born World Cup winners since. Who are they? Do you want to have a go, Tony? Well, there'll be some French players, I guess. They're all French, in fact. Are well, they all French? Okay. So Zidane was Algerian, wasn't he? But he wasn't born in Algeria. He was born in oh, Marseille. Okay. Uh, two from 98 and two from the 2018. Era? The error is one from Senegal. Comes from Senegal. Um, Trezeguet? Nope. Marcel Desailly. Oh, Desailly, of course. Desailly, yeah. And then the others were from the recent one, were they? 2018. That's right. Steve Mandanda and Samuel Mtiti. I wouldn't have got those two over. There'll be another teaser at the end of this episode. I love a teaser. The teaser coming up at the the end of this episode is the most needlessly tenuous and impossible that I've written yet. Wow. That is saying something because some of these have been hard. The only only better teaser than a tenuous teaser is a mull teaser. Hey. So, the World Cup. Colombia are hosting. Yeah. Are they? Yeah. They win the bid unopposed. But between when they were awarded in 1974 and 1982, FIFA have expanded the tournament from 16 to 24 teams. So Colombia said, no, we're not, we're not doing it. 
It's like a house party that you promised would only be a few friends. And good, then good on them, yeah. it's a spiral out of control. And then mum's just go going, no. Someone put it on Facebook. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Columbia say it would cost too much to meet FIFA's criteria. So in 1983, they pull out. Is criteria another word for bribe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. So three countries then bid to host the World Cup in less than sort of three years' time, this is going to be. And the three countries are Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Henry Kissinger, the former United States Secretary of State. Uh, said, and war criminal. Just yeah. just throwing that out. <laughs> okay. Who led the US bid committee. Is he not going to put it on in Cambodia against the <laughs> He said... The politics of soccer make me nostalgic for the politics of the Middle East. And, of course, now they're the same thing, so he'd, he'd be delighted with that. <laughs> Mexico gets all the votes. They win unanimously. It is the uh, first time a country has won a competitive vote to host unanimously. And Mexico becomes the first of five countries so far to host the World Cup twice. No one really knows why Mexico won it unanimously. A lot of people say it's because everyone was nostalgic for 1970, which in their head had been like the best World Cup. As we know on this podcast, it's only actually the second best World Cup to this point. Yeah. But it could also be because the head of FIFA, Jao Havalange, was best mates with Emilio Azcarraga, the millionaire owner of Televisa Mexicana. Just coincidence. We can never tell what these things. Also, uh, less than a year before the World Cup, in September of 1985, an earthquake with a magnitude of 8.0 hits Mexico City, killing 5,000 and damaging 3,500 buildings. So that's that's going to put set them back a little bit. Mm. On the anniversary of that quake, to this day, Mexico conducts evacuation drills. And in 2017, there was another earthquake, this time with a magnitude of 7.1, that happened two hours after they'd done the drill. Oh, wow. Just... All right, yeah, we get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, this real this time. Yeah. That's either good in a way because people are prepared or not good as in people who would think, oh, geez, just another test again. If it was British people, they definitely wouldn't have evacuated the second no. time. <laughs> in qualifying, 110 teams are going for 22 spaces. Israel and Chinese Taipei were both put in Oceania. Chinese Taipei, they score one goal in the entire thing, and the guy who scores it plays for Flying Camel FC. Oh, I'm a big fan of Flying Camel FC. Yes, yeah, so yeah. Chinese Taipei concede 36 goals in six games. For the home nations, England, very sportingly, let Northern Ireland draw with them nil-nil at Wembley to ensure both teams progress at the expense of Romania. Romania is still bitter about that. There's some brilliant things from qualifying. There's an American in the American qualifying called Chance Fry, which seems made up. I don't know. Have you seen American names? If it was now, it'd be Chance Deep Fried, but you know. <laughs> Zambia's match, which is in the Africa qualification, are held at the Dag Hammarskjöld uh, Stadium, which is the third largest city in Zambia. And for some reason, it's named after a Swedish Secretary General of the UN. And literally no one can tell me why. I might have a, an inkling of why that is. Didn't um, one of them died in a plane crash in somewhere in Africa? Really? Was, oh. Yeah. This is my brain is full of shit like this. <laughs> so, oh, he died in a in an air crash in Rhodesia, which is now Zambia, and so they uh, they named a stadium after him, as you, oh. as you would. I think that's the spot uh, where the plane crashed. Did <laughs> it cleared out a big enough area for a football pitch? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, well, something good might as well have come from this. Just while we're on weird stadiums in Africa, Sierra Leone Stadium uh, was named the Siaka Stevens Stadium after their corrupt dictator. And then obviously when he died and then there was a coup, they stopped naming it after that. And then they renamed it after the dictator years after his death, 16 years after it, because they stopped winning things and they thought it was lucky. It's very important to have a lucky dictator, isn't it? Thank good the Germans didn't go down that route. <laughs> Scotland and Wales play at Ninian Park, and Wales need to win. Scotland are without Sooners, Dalglish, Hansen and Archibald, and their goalkeeper, Jim Layton, loses a contact lens in the first half, just before Mark Hughes scores. Jim Layton had not told anyone that he was short-sighted and was wearing contact lenses. <laughs> he also 
doesn't have a spare set. And this is the point of what? One, two substitutions? So Strachan was supposed to come off at half time because he's not really been coping very well with it. And then they had to substitute the goalie. So Strachan has to go back on. And Jim Layton's about to argue with him. And Strachan is also about to argue with Jockstein. But he's sweating profusely and looks really ill. And so system manager Alex Ferguson says, probably leave it, lads. And then uh, the second half happens. Davy Cooper scores a penalty with nine minutes to go, which sends Scotland to the playoff with Australia and sends Wales out. But just before full time, Jockstein collapses and is taken to the dressing room to be resuscitated. Half an hour after the final whistle, he's pronounced dead of a pulmonary edema which is fluid in the lungs. He died pretty much in the changing rooms, didn't he? It was, uh, uh, basically, what had happened was he was supposed to be taking beta blockers or something similar, but decided it made him too fuzzy and it made him look wrong on camera uh, when he was meeting the press and stuff, so he decided not to take them. Yeah, famous, of course, European Cup winning manager of Celtic. And yeah. w- what a strange evening that must have been for Scotland supporters. It's like the the euphoria of, yes, we're still in the World Cup, but this legend has has died. Alex Ferguson takes charge of Scotland for the playoff, which Scotland win 2-0 on aggregate. I was just going to say, whatever happened to him? I don't know. It's not, I couldn't find anything about him. <laughs> we're going to say hello to Canada, Denmark and Iraq, who have played all of their home games in qualifying in Kuwait, India and Saudi Arabia because of the Iran-Iraq war. And while they were in Kuwait, they'd look around and went, looks nice here, we should come back. <laughs> yeah. We say welcome back to South Korea for the first time since 1954. Paul, the fictional country of Paraguay, are back. It doesn't exist. No one's Paul been does, there. Have Paul you met a Paraguayan? No. Incredibly, one of our listeners, Steve, got in touch to say, can you tell Paul that Paraguay does exist because I've been there? No, it, 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 Steve exists. Are you, are you a Paraguay denier then, Paul? Is that what yeah. You've got a YouTube channel. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's the paranormal version of Uruguay. That's all it is. Yeah, look, the clue's in the name, isn't it? Para. Also coming back, Portugal for the first time since 1966 and Morocco for the first time since 1970. And we're going to say goodbye to Iraq, Northern Ireland and Hungary. This is their last appearance. A couple of quick more ones from qualifying. Two of America's qualification games are played in the stadium that is used in the Adam Sandler film The Longest Yard. And East Germany had a goal scorer in qualifying called Ralph Minge. (laughs) (laughs) It'll be Minga. Which is also hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Which one are you? Are you a Minga or are you a Minge? And that's it. his fun game show that he likes to play on local radio. Really, yeah. really good in and around the box. <laughs> <laughs> we should totally pitch Minge or Minga to Channel 5. <laughs> Notable absentees, the Netherlands. They got through to the playoff and then got beaten by Belgium. This is the Netherlands with Hullet, Rijkaard and Van Basten. Soon to become European champions. They lose on away goals against Belgium. They have Wim Kieft sent off after three minutes of the first leg after Frankie Verkouteren does a bit of theatrical diving. When they go to the return leg in Rotterdam, he needs bodyguards. <laughs> but Georges Grun scores the away goal five minutes from the end of the second leg, which sends Belgium through and the Netherlands out. Also missing are the Asian champions, Saudi Arabia, and the AFCON winners, Egypt. Do you remember, Tony, the mascot of the 1986 World Cup? I do, yeah. It was like um, a, a chilli pepper, wasn't it? Like a, with a sombrero. It was like, if you could imagine, the most stereotypical Mexican cartoon character. And then put it in a sombrero to be double Yeah, racist. I mean, is it a bit racist? <laughs> yes. It um, was presumably designed by a Mexican, and the Mexican committee so? okayed it. It is a mustachioed jalapeno pepper in a jalapeno sombrero. Pepper. What was it called? Uh, usually like a pun uh, on the... It was, it was PK, oh, so PK, it's a pun it on PK, yeah. being spicy and also penalty kick. Ah, PK, yeah. Yes, it is the second fruit in a row to be a World Cup mascot Ooh, after Naranjito. Yeah, so it's technically in a fruit, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, there haven't been any more fruits of World Cup mascots. No. By the way, one last thing from, I know, uh, from qualification. Peru were 1-0 up in their last game against Argentina, and then Argentina come back and equalised with about 10 minutes to go. But if they hadn't, Peru would have qualified automatically and sent Argentina to the playoffs, and history might be very different. But it's not. 
It's not. When we get to alternative World Cups of other universes, when this uh, podcast ends. The extended multiverse of World Cups. Yeah. All right, here's a question for you. Moving at an average speed of 27 miles an hour, what invention of crazy George Henderson became famous during this World Cup? I don't know. This might be wrong. An invention. He invented it. Uh, Apparently. I, I would say this is either genius guess or the most stupid guess ever. But is it the Mexican wave? It is. It is. Well done, Tony. Oh, wow. Yes. How can one uh, man invent a Mexican wave? Surely that. <laughs> he was just incredibly charismatic. One well, man yeah. cannot invent a Mexican wave. It is contentious that he invented it, but no one else claims it. And they basically have traced it back to the late 70s in American sports. And he was like a um, radio personality and he got a crowd to do it once. And no one can think of a time before then when it happened. And do they all move at 26 miles an hour? An average speed of 27 miles oh, an hour. Average. Some are quicker, some are slower. So, yeah, it had been a thing in American sports for six or seven years. It was the first time English eyes had seen it. And so we named it the Mexican Wave after the Mexico World Cup. But in America, it's just called the Wave. Mexican Waves have been banned by Cricket Australia since 2007. Because they're no fun. It's just health and safety gone mad, isn't it? Thank God for Brexit. <laughs> we don't have to put up with any of that nonsense. <laughs> and the longest ever wave lasted for 28 minutes and 35 seconds. Uh, it was during an esports tournament in Newark, New Jersey. And that proves that esports are boring. 1986, very much peak World Cup single era. However, England's We've Got the Whole World at Our Feet. We've got the whole world at our feet. There's not a single team that we can beat. And Scotland's Big Trip to Mexico. Taking the big trip to Mexico. The World Cup is waiting. We're set to go. Are phoning it in so much. They sound like keyboard demo tracks. Both written by the same guy, Tony Hiller who'd written the Eurovision Song Contest winner Save All Your Kisses For Me by Brotherhood of Man. Ooh. Kisses for me, save all your kisses for me. They're like, oh, yeah, we'll do some football songs and they won't be bothered with it. And none of the footballers are like, oh, yeah, we, if we have to sing on this. And then a year later, Chris Waddle and Glenn Hoddle do Diamond Lights. Diamond Lights. Which is off their own back. No one's asked them to do it. It's not for anything. They wanted to do it. And that was actually all right. That wasn't too, that wasn't terrible. Darling, what? I love you. <laughs> Diamond Lights. Diamond Lights is, is reasonable. As an 80s song, it's not bad. All right. <laughs> I've lost, James has lost faith in me as a guest now. He's thinking, we can't have this guy with this judgment. Diamond Lights got to number 12 in the UK charts. What was the official name of the artist? Waddle and Hoddle, wasn't it? Or Hoddle and Waddle. No, it was Glenn and Chris. Oh, for pity's sake. What a waste. The song was written by the same guy who wrote I'm in the Mood for Dancing by the Nolans. I'm in the Mood for Dancing. Their Top of the Pops appearance was described by Chris Waddle as one of the worst things I've ever done and by Glenn Hoddle as one of the greatest things I've ever done. <laughs> um, yes. There was a follow-up single called It's Goodbye, which got to number 92. Chris Waddle also did another song with Basil Bolly when they were both at Marseille together. My favourite fact of all time that Chris Waddle, to counteract homesickness at Marseille because he missed England, what did he watch on repeat? Was it like Auf Wiedersehen Pet, which is set in Germany, so that would be weird? <laughs> no. Um, I bet it was um, Jossie's Giants. No, he had, a, he had a Paul Daniels Magic video that he just watched on repeat because that, <laughs> <made it, laughs> that made him happy. Can I just say, Basil Bolly, by the way, that's a great name for the past, isn't it? I think possibly the bravest man ever, because he headbutted Stuart Pierce, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he did. Like French kissing a shark or something. Just like, okay. Yeah. Basil Bolly never played in a World Cup, fact fans. So we shouldn't even yeah, be mentioning him. Euros 92, wasn't yeah. it, against yeah. when he headbutted Stuart Pierce? Other football songs from this World Cup. Black Lace released Viva La Mexico. Viva la, viva lo, viva la, la, la Mexico. 
which managed to mix Spanish and French in a three-word title. <laughs> <laughs> on the basis that all foreign languages are the same. Uh, we also give a special mention to Germany, who released a single featuring old white guy rapping. <laughs> and <laughs> just the weirdest one I found yet, and I'm a bit obsessed with it, Peter Dean, yes, Pete Beale off of EastEnders, who releases a song called Can't Get a Ticket for the World Cup which starts with him telling his mother to pack his bags because he's off to see the Old World Cup. Morning, Mum, you pack my bags, I'm off to see the Old World Cup. <laughs> pack your own damn bags, Peter. You're 37 years old. <laughs> he's missed the Old World Cup anyway because it's the new World Cup now, isn't it? He can't go and see the Old World Cup. No one knows where it is after 1983. Anyway, there's a new format. Yay! Format number eight, the best format, in my opinion. Six groups of four, the top two go through, plus the four best third-place teams go into a knockout, which means that everyone is still in the World Cup until their third game. There are no dead rubbers. Here's a little quirk of the World Mm -hmm. Cup. Something's missing from this World Cup that is a feature of all the others, but is not in this one. Which is, I know is a really vague question. There's no way you could possibly guess from that. Studs. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I was in really sexy men. Yeah, just... Oh. Um, Not men. Okay, boys. I'm going to... Off the wall, I'm going to say... Oh, there's no ball boys. Corner no, there oh, there's, no, there's no mascots. Corner flags. No, there are corner flags. No, no, no. no corner flags because of the earthquake. The flags were all being used to mark wreck sites. <laughs> No, there are corner flags at the 1966 World Cup. Uh, I'll I'll tell you why. Because a week before the World Cup starts, Francisco Cruz of Mexico, who is the youngest player at this World Cup, celebrates his 20th birthday. So there are no teenagers at this World Cup. It's the only time that happens. There's no Argentina away shirt either, is there? One emerges, but yes, that's also true. We'll get into that. So starting Group A... We've got Italy, the holders, as well as Argentina, Bulgaria, and South Korea. The opening game is a veritable goal fest as far as opening games go, because it's one all. Alessandro Altabelli, having scored Italy's last goal in 1982, scores their first goal in this tournament and the first goal of the tournament. And he is the only Italian player to score in this World Cup. Luckily, he scores loads. He gets one in a one all draw with Argentina which is the fourth consecutive World Cup where Argentina and Italy play each other, a record that is beaten in the next World Cup when Argentina and Italy play each other again. (laughs) They play play each other in five consecutive World Cups, and that that has never happened since. And he scores twice in a tense 3-2 win over South Korea. The Italian goal that isn't scored by him is scored by Cho Quang Rae, the South Korean midfielder who is nicknamed Computer Linker. <laughs> Those crazy um, South Koreans. Because of his accurate passing, and he accurately passes into his own goal in this no. game. That wouldn't have been that much of a compliment in 1986, though, would it? Computers weren't exactly. <laughs> 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 Computer Linker as well. I think he's invented the internet. His name is Modem. That's what we call him. <laughs> ha Jung Moo scores a last minute consolation goal for South Korea. Uh, he'd gone to manage South Korea in 2010, and he once had his nose broken by... Basil Bolle. Johan Cruyff. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> dirty, dirty did, Johan Cruyff. He did a Cruyff turn and took it off his face. Just wah, just turned it the other way around. Maradona-inspired Argentina win their other two games. Oscar Ruggeri, their centre-half, scores a free kick against South Korea. He's nicknamed El Cabazon, the, the big-headed was, one. He was the proto-Harry Maguire. <laughs> yeah, he was. He was linked with Ipswich in 1994 when we got to the, when we were in the Premier League, along with Gabriel Batistuta. Ah, the two were wow. going to come over. We, we were going to go Argentina double, and we ended up with Adrian Paz, who got a very unfortunate nickname, and Maurizio Tarico, who wasn't too bad. But we were apparently going for Ruggieri and Batistuta. You say they were linked. Were they regular linked or computer linked? They were computer linked by a South Korean. I'm sorry that Ruggieri let you down as an Ipswich fan, but you'll be delighted to know that in 2016, he appeared on Argentinian Strictly Come Dancing, where he came 12th out of 30. 
Yeah, it's a really long show. They must have calves of steel by the end of that. That's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, Home of the Tango, you'd have thought they're a pretty high standard, wouldn't you? He finished higher up than Diego Maradona Jr. and Evander Holyfield, but he finished below Charlotte Kanigia, who is Claudio Ooh. Kanigia's daughter. Oh. Now, even though Bulgaria haven't won a game, a one-all draw against South Korea is enough to see them scrape through the groups. Their goal comes from Plamen Getov, who, after Hungary's Laszlo Kiss in 1982, is the second World Cup goalscorer with the same name as a print single. Get up. 23 positions in a one-night stand. So South Korea are the only team in Group A who are eliminated. Their squad features their goalkeeper, Cho byung Duk, who played for Hallelujah FC. Oh, yes, please. I wonder what their fans sing. <laughs> well, I suppose you've got the Hallelujah Chorus if your team's winning. Hallelujah. Or you've yep. got the uh, Leonard Cohen song if your team's losing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They have Park Kyung Hoon at right back, who becomes the first <laughs> South Korean to play in the FA Cup when he turns out for Yedding of the Istomian League in 1993. Their star player is Cha Bum Kun, who played for Bayer Leverkusen and had 100 international caps by the time he was 24. Wow. He's the all-time South Korean top scorer with 58 goals in 136 games. He manages South Korea in 1998, and his son is Cha Du Ri, who, despite being born in Frankfurt, represented South Korea in two World Cups as well. So, so hang on a minute. So he only represented... South Korea 36 more times after he was 24. Yeah. Yeah, lazy. What happened? He, he got complacent. He obviously got addicted to the uh, computer links. <laughs> Stop bloody playing That's on that computer. I'm sure this one can be trusted. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> got a virus. In Group B, we've got the hosts, Mexico, Belgium, Iraq, and Paraguay. This is why I love the World Cup. They're four countries you would never put together in any other situation, are they? Particularly because Paraguay aren't real. Everyone beats Iraq, which means everyone apart from Iraq qualifies from the group. God, I bet Iraq... that went down with their uh, leader in the yep, country. Yeah, a big fan oh. of that. The Iraq team is managed by Evaristo, a Brazilian who missed out in 1958 because Barcelona wouldn't release him to play for Brazil in the World Cup. That's a bit tight, isn't it? Belgium have got Jean-Marie Pfaff back in goal. He's inspired the BBC singers... Not that BBC and not that BBC. <laughs> to release a song all about him, which sounds like the theme tune to a 1980s cartoon series. It isn't, but I would love to watch it. I always thought Faf was like a very bad name for a goalkeeper, wasn't it? It's the opposite of nominative determinism. Against Belgium, Ahmed Radi becomes the only Iraqi, or the, and also the... <laughs> First Iraqi to score at a World Cup. In 2007, he'd be nominated to the Iraqi parliament. Samir Shakir spits at the referee and is banned for a year and never plays for Iraq again. And the brilliantly named Basil Gorgeous. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> Mr. Gorgeous. The thing is, I think it's pronounced Georges. Right. But it's I'm spelled gonna, Gorgeous. Well, look up Basil Gorgeous because I've got a very strong picture in my head. Of what Basil Gorgeous <laughs> looks like. What do you and think I'm, Basil Gorgeous looks like? That, well, that, in my head, looks Basil like... Gorgeous is a 1930s silver matinee idol. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's a matinee idol. He's got he's got a, a curled, oiled moustache. Yeah, uh, I mean, he's got a moustache, I'll give you that. He gets booked by mistake during one of the games. Because he's too and, gorgeous. Yeah. Referee Jesus Diaz was trying to book Ganam Oraibi, and he books Basil Gorgeous by mistake. And Basil Gorgeous sarcastically applauds him for booking the wrong player, at which point Diaz sends him off. <laughs> it seems like entrapment it's, to me. It's the anti Graham Pohl. You're giving, you sent off for one yellow card. In their game against Paraguay, Ahmed Radi heads a goal, but the referee, Edwin Picon Akong of Mauritius, had just blown for half time. He's very much the Mauritian Clive Thomas. Hugo Sanchez has a penalty saved by Roberto Fernandez, the Paraguayan goalkeeper who's nicknamed El Gato. The cat. Oh, I thought it was the cake. Paraguay's equaliser is scored by Romerito, who once sang at a Paraguayan rock festival with the band Revolver. 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 They're a Paraguayan <laughs> band, so they don't exist. <laughs> and against Belgium, Paraguay's manager, Caetano Ray, is the 
first coach to be red carded at a World Cup game. Do we have any details on why, or is he just being a bit arsey for trying to get Basil Gorgeous's phone number? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's temperament, isn't it? We need some kind of siren for stereotypes. <laughs> Anytime someone says the Latins are fiery and the Africans can't defend, we'll yeah. do that. Germans are organised. Brazil playing to a samba beat. Oh yeah, lies. England are shit. <laughs> <laughs> Group C features the European and Olympic champions, France. Also, Hungary, the USSR, and the CONCACAF champions, Canada. So the group is basically two good teams, two bad teams. Yeah. France have my all-time favourite name to say of a footballer, which is Jean-Pierre Papin. Since I was a kid, I just love that name. I think it's brilliant. It hits all of the right rhythms of Jean-Pierre Papin. Yeah, couldn't be more he'd, win, cheap, he'd win the Ballon d'Or in 1991, but this is the only World Cup he ever plays in. French spitting image do a song about him that I can't make head nor tail of. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I was always disappointed that he never did a Renault advert with Steve Nichol. Nicole. Papa? So everyone in this group beats Canada, but Canada, unlike Iraq, they don't even score a goal. They do have Mike Sweeney sent off, which means that like Zaire, Bolivia and Trinidad and Tobago, they've had more World Cup red cards than goals. Yeah. Have you have you got the um, Canada squad list there, by the way? Yeah. I don't suppose Frank Yallop's in it, is he? No. The only British base players in that squad were Terry Moore, who played for Glen Torren, and Colin Miller, who played for Rangers. They had Randy Samuel. I don't know what his surname was. Uh, <laughs> who, who played for PSV, which is quite good. In fact, there, there are two Randys. There's Randy Reagan as well in the oh, I mean, that sounds like, like we were talking about French spitting image. That sounds like <laughs> it's 10 to 5 on a Friday. We've got a shoot tomorrow. Come on, that'll do. Randy Reagan. A bunch of them play for weird North American soccer teams with strange names. Do you want to hear those? Yes, please. How many of these will be natural be disasters? There's a lot of Vancouver Whitecaps, isn't there, surely? No. There's a couple of players who play for the Cleveland Force. Branco Segota, who plays for the San Diego Sockers. That's Sockers with a K in it. Oh, okay. like they wear okay. socks or well, they're socking people, people like Batman. Yeah. yeah. Pascal De Luca, he plays for the Edmonton Brickmen. <laughs> I really hope that they're just all Lego enthusiasts. That's the. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're all made of Lego. <laughs> <laughs> Fall apart in the box. And incredibly, Greg Ion, that's I O N, Greg Ion plays for the Los Angeles Lasers. Oh, very nice. He was later charged, wasn't he? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Unused sub goalkeeper Sven Harberman later takes a prototype pepper spray onto Canadian Dragon's Den and gets investment from all five dragons. <laughs> wow. Turns out all he had to do was threaten them with pepper spray. <laughs> Hungary beat Canada 2 0. Their first goal is scored by Martin Esterhazy, who is a member of Hungarian aristocracy. Ooh. Is, that, is he called like the Baron or the Earl or something? No, just Martin. Oh, disappointing. But then USSR beat Hungary 6 0. It was a bit of um, a demonstration of their power over. You know, yes, yeah, soft lot. power. Yeah. That was a real statement, wasn't it? Don't step out of line, Hungary. The coach of the USSR, Valery Lobanovsky, is also the coach of Dynamo Kiev. He only takes over two weeks before the finals and he completely repicks the squad. And fills it with players from Dynamo Kiev. Yeah, I was nine... say, he basically picks the Dynamo Kiev team, doesn't he? I think. Yeah, nine of the starting 11 play for Dynamo Kiev. So it's essentially Ukraine playing here for the USSR. Oh. Uh, three of the starting 11 have the same birthday. That's weird, isn't it? Uh, yeah. The 19th of December. Oh, I was going to say 27th of August. <laughs> <laughs> No. Ooh, quiz question. Only people who are obsessively listening to this podcast will know that that is the third mention of the 19th of December. It keeps coming up that date, and I don't know why. Turns out USSR are really good. France are really good as well. They beat Hungary 3-0. Marley-born future Fulham manager Jean Tiganard scores his only goal for France in that game. And their third goal is scored by Dominique Rocheteau, who was nicknamed Langevin. The is green. Lounge, green lounge, green couch, yeah, the green angel. 
This is the third consecutive World Cup that he's scored in. He's apparently really left wing and he has a three film film career. Because he appears in probably the most French film of all time. It came out in 1995. It's called La Gassou, and it stars Gérard Depardieu, as you would expect, in which Gérard leaves his wife, has several mistresses, but doesn't know how to leave them, and then his wife takes on a new lover, played by Dominique Rocheteau. <laughs> <laughs> My wife, come back to me. No. I am with former World Cup striker, <laughs> goal scorer at the 1986 group stage, Dominic Rushter. It has an IMDb rating of 6.6. In 2013, he's in the film On My Way, which stars Catherine Deneuve, which is about a married couple who are both having affairs. <laughs> Spot a theme here. <laughs> yeah, has an IMDb rating of 6.4. And he's in 2005, he's in the mockumentary Casablanca Driver, which is about the world's worst boxer, which also stars Jim Carter off of Downton Abbey. Uh, it doesn't say oh. if they have affairs in it or not. Yeah, it's thrown in as a mid-credit sequence. <laughs> just... but by the way, everyone in this film was having an affair. A fun thing happens in the France-USSR one-all draw. Yeah, because in this game, Rats scores against Bats. Yes, I noticed that. And it's quite the goal as well. Vasily oh, Rats of yeah. the USSR absolutely blathers it past Joel Bats, the French goalkeeper. It's like some sort of weird child's game, isn't it? Rats beats Bats. Yeah. Uh, cows beats rats. Surely cats. Oh, beat, cats, yeah. So cats rats. beats rats. Rats beats bats. This was when the world was briefly written by Dr. Seuss. Yeah. <laughs> hey, have you ever played a board game? You have? Then you'll love my book, 101 Board Games to Play Before You Die. I look at the board games that we've loved, hated and thrown across the room in a fit of rage. I'll tell you which classic games are not worth the time and emotional torment and which games you should be playing instead, as well as giving you advice on how to make your dinner parties more tolerable and how to pimp your Scrabble. The perfect gift for your nerdy friend, it's available from 101boardgames.com. That's 101boardgames.com. Group D, Algeria, Brazil, Northern Ireland and Spain. A tricky one for Northern Ireland, that, I'd say. Impossible, some would argue. We've got the Algerians that were hard done by, weren't they, in the last World Cup? Spain and Northern Ireland again. Brazil beat Spain, but Michel has a shot that hits the underside of the bar and bounces over the line, but is not given. And then, of course, oh. Dirty Den gets him pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> But both Brazil and Spain beat Algeria and Northern Ireland, which means a winner in the game between Algeria and Northern Ireland would go through to the next round, but it's a one-all draw. The Algerian goal is scored by Jamel Zidane, who is not related to Zinedine Zidane. In the Northern Ireland game against Spain, Colin Clark, who is playing for third division Bournemouth at the time, uh, scores a ridiculous goal after mm. the uh, Spanish goalkeeper and defender just get into a whole mixer. Uh, Colin Clark would go on to manage Puerto Rico. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> I was going to say, as a player, I think Colin Clark stuck to the South Coast, didn't he? Play for Portsmouth as well. But yeah, yeah obviously, when he became manager, he went a bit further. Maybe now he's in the Antarctica somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, finally, I found my people. After that game, Ramon Calderi tests positive in a doping test, but is not sanctioned because it turns out he was on antibiotics for diarrhoea. <laughs> We've humiliated you enough. You can either be sent home in disgrace for drugs or tell everyone that you've got the shits. <laughs> Montezuma's He's... revenge, isn't it? Probably. Yeah. A game I remember watching. I was Ooh. eight years old when the 1986 World Cup happened and I just got into football. So I remember a few of the games. A lot of the games were in the middle of the night and I wasn't allowed to stay up for them. But I remember watching Northern Ireland play Brazil. I vaguely remember watching that as well. My memory of the 86 World Cup is that you used to, I don't know if this is correct, but I remember that I used to watch all the football, the highlights in the morning. I think they used to show the previous evening's highlights in the morning. So I think before school, I'd see most of the goals from the day before. And do you remember the ITV theme tune? Oh, the ITV theme tune was superb, wasn't it? The BBC and ITV were both called Aztec, I think, weren't it? Aztec Gold yeah. was the ITV one, was it? That's right. And it went on to be the theme tune to... This podcast! Satan Greavesy, it? No, Satan Greavesy. Which was the theme to this podcast? The BBC one from this world, ah. uh, which was called <laughs> Aztec Lightning. This was a peak era of, of theme tunes as well, weren't it? They were great 
World Cup theme tune. I couldn't tell you any of the recent ones. They're all a bit more bland now, aren't they? What I remember about that Northern Ireland game, it, was, it took place on Pat Jennings' 41st birthday. Happy birthday, him. Getting absolutely tonked by Brazil. He's the only player at this World Cup to have been born during the Second World War. Brazil win 3-0, including a goal from Josimar, their fullback, who's making his international debut. I understand that he was, because he was quite a late call-up, I think, Josimar, wasn't he? And he was one of those famous players that played in the World Cup but didn't have a Panini sticker. Yeah, he scores a, a brilliant goal. In my head, John Motson yells, Josimar! Like that. But I've gone back and checked the footage on YouTube, and he doesn't. <laughs> I, I imagine when you're um, at a moment of ecstasy, uh, that's what I'm hearing your that is what Josie I Moore! That is what I shared. Oh, what a goal! Also in the Northern Ireland squad, Jimmy Quinn, who had a, a football career that lasted 29 years, played until he was 45. Nigel Worthington was in defence, would go on to manage... Tony's deadly rivals. Do you know who his cousin is? Frank Worthington? No. I mean, you'd never guess. Hedley Lamar? (laughs) (laughs) What, from Blazing Saddles? It's not Hedy, it's Hedley. Hedley Lamar. No, his cousin is Brendan Rodgers. Brendan Rodgers? Yeah, Brendan Rodgers and Nigel Worthington are cousins. Also, Ian Stewart, the winger who played for Newcastle United, was in the Northern Ireland squad. He's significant. Do you know why? Have you ever heard of him before? No. No. Didn't he invent double-sided sticky tape? No, he didn't. He was the first British player to have a Nike endorsement. Really? Wow. wow. That Nike? Yeah. <laughs> like window fitters from Belfast. <laughs> <laughs> Algeria are also out. Their squad featured the forward Rashid Hakouk, who was actually born in London. He would play for Notts County. And in 2011, he was jailed for 28 months for conspiring to supply illegal drugs. Group E, West Germany, the Danes, the Scots, and the Copa champions, Uruguay. This is a good group. Uh, The Uruguayan coach, Omar Boris, calls it the group of death. Is that the thing, first time that that's been called that? I think so, yes. Yeah. Debutants Denmark win all of their games, including... 6-1 6-1 against Uruguay. It is an absolute hammering because even the one goal that Uruguay get is a penalty. And there's a guy in it who I'd not heard of before who just absolutely runs riot. Uh, Do you mean Prebenelkia? Prebenelkia, yeah. How have yeah, I not heard of him? Prebenelkia. Yeah, never heard of him. And then he's amazing. He gets a hat-trick. Well, he'd been the top scorer in World Cup qualifying that year. Prebenelkia plays for Hellas Verona. He's nicknamed... Il Sindaco by the Verona fans, which means the mayor. Mayor! Like the sound of that. To this day, he still gets hundreds of write in votes in the Verona mayoral elections. <laughs> <laughs> that would be just too funny, Wave, because if you get enough, you have to do it, probably. <laughs> just like, we all thought it'd be funny to set to write in Prebenelkia, and then he's now in charge of sanitation and having to open local branches of whatever quick savers in Italy. He's, he's only actually never become the mayor of Rona because he gets beaten by Mayor McMayface. <laughs> Presto Salva. <laughs> have you just looked up what quick save is in Italian? Yeah. <laughs> it's actually Salvataggio Veloce. But oh, whoa. <laughs> also scoring wine importer Michael Loudrup and oh. Soren Lerby, who didn't wear shin pads in the eighties. Yeah, well. He's playing Uruguay. Yeah, Uruguay. Like that's mm. that's a death wish. It's like doing a Formula One race naked. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Another game I remember: Scotland versus West Germany. I remember this game because Gordon Strachan scores. Yeah. Scotland take the lead. Do you remember what happens next? They immediately equalise? No, before no. that. When he scores, what does he do? Doesn't his todger fall out of his shorts? No. <laughs> <laughs> There's a famous picture, isn't it, of Gordon Strachan, like, with his tackle hanging out of his shorts. So maybe Google that. How would I even look for that? Uh, <laughs> Just my big Gordon Strachan todger. Because it happened to Peter Beardsley and Paul Scholes as well, hasn't it? Oh, I remember the Paul Scholes one where it was the because it was on. Oh, they think it's all over where they went. Oh, complained that the spot the ball competition was too easy this week. And it's just, hey. Have you finished finding it yet? Yeah, it's not there. I remember uh, actually, I woke up dreaming of that, and I suddenly went, "Yotsi Ma!" <laughs> <laughs> 
No, what happens is a load of players in the World Cup to this point had, when they'd scored, jumped over the advertising hoardings and run around the athletics track to celebrate. Oh, yes. So oh, Strachan yeah. runs up to it. He's he too go. small to jump over it. So he just sort of puts his leg on it for yeah, a like bit. like a dog <laughs> pissing up a lamppost. He? <laughs> Does a little bit of calisthenic stretching. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and, that's... and then his todger falls out. So, uh, <laughs> oh, that wasn't his leg on the advertising hall. That was... <laughs> Let's just say Mrs. Strachan's a very lucky woman. <laughs> uh, but you're right, Germany do equalise and then they score a winner. I remember that being like the first game of football where I felt a massive sense of injustice <laughs> for no reason. I wanted Scotland to win and they lost. But because of how these new groups work, all they have to do is beat Uruguay in their final game. To qualify. And, that and, is all and, Scotland have to do. And Uruguay really helped them by doing what in the first minute? Isn't it the fastest sent me off ever in? Yeah, yeah. Like, they literally kick off and get get kicked. The ref sends them off, and then they somehow don't use that to their to advantage. And let's face it, you had to be pretty serious to get yourself sent off in the eighties as well. You had to practice yeah, yeah, heads yeah. on. I mean, that is not a niggling foul that he does. That is a common or garden assault, I'd say. Yes. <laughs> Jose Batista sent off after 55 seconds. Uh, as you correctly point out, the fastest World Cup sending off. I'm so glad that when um, he said, what do they do in the first minute, you didn't go get their todgers out. <laughs> <laughs> they lube up. <laughs> Is he related to Dave Batista, by the way? No. <laughs> Despite having Frank McAvenny and Charlie Nicholas on the bench, Scotland persists with Graham Sharp on his own up front for the rest of the game. Mm. And obviously, he doesn't score. And Scotland don't score, and they are out. So, would we say that with two losses and a draw, that Alex Ferguson is Scotland's worst ever World Cup manager? Well, apart from the ones in the 50s. But certainly of this, of this run where they, they qualify for like it's six in seven World Cups, I think. Yeah, this is their... Oh, no, they're pretty bad in 98 as well. Yeah, I just kind of want to be like, maybe Alex Ferguson was shit. <laughs> <laughs> Needlessly <laughs> contentious. <laughs> so incredibly, Uruguay, despite not having won a game and being beaten 6-1, have qualified for the second round. Narrowly edging out Hungary, who also conceded six goals in a game, but had won a game because they're still doing two points for a win. Scotland, though, they're out. Their squad featured Richard Goff, who was born in... M- Malawi. Nope. Singapore. Stockholm. Stockholm. Ooh. Would also have accepted the wagon of a travelling show. <laughs> Graham Souness was playing in his third and final World Cup when he's not having a go at Paul Pogba, he has been a vegan since 2018. What? Why are he so angry? He had a house in Edinburgh, but he sold it to disgraced banker Sir Fred Goodwin. He was nicknamed Champagne Charlie, which is weird because that's not his first name. Well, you can't have Champagne Champagne Graham. No, Champagne Graham is the Cinnamon Graham's (laughs) (laughs) one-off. It's a million-pound box of cereal, Champagne Graham's. There was a Champagne Charlie in the Scotland squad, Champagne Charlie Nicholas. He was in the squad. Because Scotland, you said they had Frank McAvenny and Charlie Nicholas on the bench. Is that the yeah. biggest head ever to be on a <laughs> bench? If you're doing a piss head 11, they've, surely they've got both of you, haven't they? Yeah. <laughs> Frank McAvenny was once a guest on Wogan, during wow. which he said, when I signed for West Ham, money and girls were thrown at me, and who was I to say no? He said, I was never under any illusions why it was happening. It was not because of my looks. It was because I was a footballer. Paul Sturrock was in the squad. He'd gone to manage uh, Plymouth, during which time he was sued by Emil Impenza. Do you know why? As in, what, the Belgian football? Yeah, Uh, breach of copyright. If you don't know the story, I'm going to have to tell you. Because Emil Impenza, towards the end of his career, was playing for Plymouth. In Sturrock's autobiography, he wrote that one day Impenza missed training because the night before he'd taken Viagra... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and he was unable to train the next day and Mpenza sued him for saying that <laughs> so it's not true luckily Gordon Strachan never had that problem so if that was the group of death group F is nicknamed the group of sleep because it features Poland Portugal Morocco and England yeah old England. Hard. you've got like Poland who'd been a good side in the 70s Portugal uh, reasonable good World Cup pedigree. It was oh, the first time that they'd uh, been there for 20 years. 
yeah. and then Morocco. Morocco, all right. I mean, it's not the most exciting group, but group of sleep is a bit harsh. Well, you say that, but there were only two goals in the first four. I mean, games. I know it was shit in hindsight, <laughs> <laughs> but to prejudge it. The group of sleep mm. seems a bit harsh. Portugal beat England 1-0, and then they lose 1-0 to Poland. Morocco's first two games are nil nils. In England, Morocco, Brian Robson knackers his shoulder when it dislocates for the fourth time. Well, he was made of balsa wood, wasn't he? And yet went into tackles like he was made of granite. All I remember yeah. really about Brian Robson is that whenever Ron Atkinson was the pundit on any match, no matter what match, even a match not involving Brian Robson, he would pick Brian Robson as the man of the match. <laughs> <laughs> and then Ray Wilkins throws the ball at the Paraguayan referee and is sent off. It's yeah, so is innocuous. He, is he just giving the ball back? Yeah, yeah. And Ray Wilkins said in later years, I didn't intend to hit the referee. I'd have put a bit more fire behind it if I did. I just yeah, he, was, he was always too accurate with his passing, though, wasn't he? He's like <laughs> a little less accurate to miss the ref. He is the first England player to be sent off of a World Cup. The first of three, all of whom play for Manchester United. The unintended consequence of Wilkins and Robson not being in the team is that suddenly Glenn Hoddle shows up. The French couldn't believe that Glenn Hoddle wasn't having the team built around him. Mm, yeah, hmm. I bristling a little bit of that. Yeah, 66 cap Glenn Hoddle was never given a chance for England. Oh, no, it's not that they were never gave him a chance. It's that they didn't, they didn't make him the focal point of the making the team around him. Well, England are going to go into their final group game against Poland, having not scored a World Cup goal for seven hours. The last one being Trevor Francis against Kuwait six games previously. But because there's no Wilkins and there's no Robson... Bobby Robson has to rejig the midfield and he brings in Peter Reid and Trevor Stephen from the brilliant mid-80s Everton team. Peter Beardsley comes in to play just behind Lineker. And then... So don't you mean Gary Lineker? Oh, yes. Mick Channing calls him Gary Lineker. Yeah. You can't go on those long runs and Lineker likes him in behind. And I think Line- I think the likes of Beardsley do great out there, especially if you can get it to his feet. I think we've got a, we've got a month to get you to say Lineker properly for a start. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Lineker. And then Gary Lineker happens... He cometh scores, the hour, cometh the man. He scores a hat-trick in 25 minutes against Poland. And some and I, lovely ones I seem to remember well. like every single one of his goals was bundled in from about two yards. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the first two, after incredibly fluid passing moves that use about four or five different players as wow. England play it from the defence up front. It's like, who are these guys? Yeah. <laughs> and, and do bear in mind that one of them is Steve Hodge. But in the other game, Portugal play Morocco. If they draw it, they both qualify, but Morocco decide to win 3-1. They are the first African team to qualify from the groups in a World Cup. So the four teams that were in the final bit of African qualification, so it's Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia and Libya, which are the four countries across the top of Africa, which is just a thing I noticed, and I did have to point out to James when I noticed that, that I am actually good fun at parties and I have done it with girls. <laughs> Morocco <laughs> topped the group. Yeah. Uh, has that happened before, an African team topping the group? No, an African team hadn't qualified from I haven't group qualified. Before. Oh, wow. No? Yeah. It's lucky for England that Morocco did win that game because had Morocco and Portugal engineered the draw they both needed to qualify, England would have gone through but they would have played in the round of 16, West Germany. Oh. Portugal's consolation goal is scored by Diamantino, who would later be thrown out of Mozambique for calling the people there thieves. Okay. And the thing is, is that Mozambique has more Portuguese speakers than Portugal, so they all understood him. So they were like, no, no, you have to go home now. There was a whole thing with the Portugal team, wasn't there, James? There was. It was the Saltillo affair, named after the Mexican city where they are based for this World Cup. Loads of stuff goes wrong, basically, for Portugal. Antonio Veloso, their fullback, was left out of the squad due to a doping test, which later turned out to be false. It was incorrect. He was absolutely fine. The training pitch was sloped and poorly maintained, and the hotel had no safety measures, it says here. <laughs> <laughs> like knives sticking out of the wall or something. Yeah. A local delegate offered to go shopping for the Portuguese players in nearby Laredo, Texas, because it was just on the other side of the border. So they gave him some money and then he just disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to go shopping for you what do you want you want some uh, American things do you, you want 
big load of Reese's pieces that you can't get in Europe. Yeah, please. That'd be twenty-seven thousand euro. Obviously, euros Euro weren't a thing. There were a load of rumours that the Portuguese players were all having affairs. It's because the phrase in Portuguese is they've been on the fence about it, which in English means oh they can't decide, but in Portuguese means you're playing away from home. And it might have been a mistranslation. An English report going, oh yeah, they were a bit on the fence about certain things. It was translated into Portuguese as. They're all having affairs. And then all of the Portuguese wives rang the embassy and were like, bring my husband home. He cannot keep it in his pants. <laughs> bit like Gordon Strachan. <laughs> then the players threatened to strike over bonuses and being made to do adverts that they weren't getting paid for. Well, I mean, they do beat England 1-0. But after that game, in training, their goalkeeper, Manuel Bento, breaks his leg and his replacement, <laughs> Vitor Damas, is suffering from depression. Also in their squad, Alvaro Magalhães, their left back, who was nicknamed Seis Dedos. Six... Fingers. A, oh. Because he had six fingers on his left hand. And he was a goalkeeper? No, he was a left back. But of course he did kill Inigo Montoya's father. So. <laughs> Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. And Paolo Futre, who would go on to play nine games for West Ham in the 90s. But then West again, who didn't? <laughs> <laughs> well, that guy that ran off and lived in a caravan, Marco Bugis. Did he have all the Portuguese players' money with him at the time? <laughs> <laughs> Before we get yeah. out of this group, I want to point out one of the Morocco players. Morocco had a player called Mustafa Meri. His last club was uh, in France. It was Olympic Grand Synth. So he was Mustafa Meri and Olympic Grand Synth, which just sounds like an electro klezma mashup. I was gonna say, they must be sponsored by Jean Michel Jarre. So, yeah, 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 yeah. We've all got an idea of what that sounds like. Sounds great. If any of our listeners are much better at music than any of us and want to create Mustafa Meri and the Olympic Grand Synth, Please do. Just a 30-second little sample would be lovely. And this from friend of the pod, Greg Smith, is Mustafa Merry and the Olympic Grand Synth. Thanks very much for that, Greg. Coming up in an unprecedented part two of our 1986 deep dive. What is going on with this podcast now? It's, it's, I feel like I'm into this real universe. One of us can buy used underwear in a vending machine. I look forward to your incredibly lucrative cancellation tour. Netflix special, here I come. And when you find out, it's because of basically... A breakdown in bureaucratic protocol is the reason the goal's given. That was like an M. Night Shyamalan twist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which would you prefer, having £7 million in your retirement, or would you prefer Terry Fenwick doesn't like you at the time? I mean, it's a win-win. You're like wow. football directed by Mel Gibson. <laughs> <laughs> Please like, subscribe, rate and review. Until part two, adieu.